I mean, I, I actually, ironically, really clearly remember on December the 29th having a look at a, a listserv of updates that happened globally uh, of, of little infectious disease issues that happen around the world. And, and I remember reading about four cases of intensive care admissions with an undifferentiated pneumonia in Wuhan and not thinking too much of it. I mean, that's winter in China. It could have been any number of different flus. Uh, and then looking at it the next day and going, oh, that's 27 in the ICU. That's, that's something significant. I remember getting the first call on Martin Luther King Day from a colleague in the evening going, hey, we've got... Uh, a whole bunch of Wuhan University graduate students here visiting and three of them have common cold symptoms. Should you be interested? It's like, yeah, the, we, we really should be. And then, yeah, I remember the first week and we actually had someone who was sick enough to legitimately need the hospital in and off their own um, fruition. And that, yeah, that was a little intimidating to sort of a bit of an unknown still, I think, at that stage as to quite what the breadth of that illness might look like and what it meant for nursing staff or physicians going into the rooms. And yet I... I think we, in hindsight, had had enough time to sort of get our ducks in a row about how to do that safely, and in retrospect, um, that really helped. A couple of the things that we always try and grapple with early in any infectious disease is what's the full extent of how sick it can make people, and clearly there were a lot of early cases reported of people being in the ICU. We didn't at that stage know how mild it could be for so many people. In fact, the asymptomatic part of it, in hindsight, got us in trouble because we didn't appreciate how easy it was to spread. Um, but then I think the other thing is to say, like, particularly for respiratory illnesses, is it hard to transmit it? Like, I have to physically cough and expel it onto someone, or is it really easy, like measles, where you can just be in the same room and have exposed everyone in the room? And, and you don't know early on. You're occurring on the other side of the planet, literally, uh, and where information access is often hard. And I think that's been litigated a lot in hindsight is to sort of say, look, did we find that sort of information out at a pace that in hindsight was appropriate? Could it have been done better? Were we appropriately cautious early on about travel? Uh, like all of those situations, I think, played out in real time. I think maybe the advantage within infectious disease is maybe perhaps we're a little more familiar with trying to cut down public health discussions to ones that can be approachable to the broader community. And I think that maybe is a different skill set than some of us are familiar with. Um, I, will, I will say that for myself, the one thing that proved to be the most um, difficult or the most interesting learning curve was to kind of battle against what I think was a national discourse that was not in favor of following public health guidelines and to be able on the other hand to adapt public health guidelines as we knew more and as the recommendations changed and explain that that's okay like, but as things evolve we may need to make different decisions. As we began to say ask the question like what's the role of a university in the middle of a pandemic it still should be to teach it absolutely should be to do good health care. Uh, and research was always going to get our way out of this. Just look at the vaccines. And so then the question was actually quite easy. It was, how do we do that safely? And, and I think many of us at that point got engaged to say, look, you know, there are good opportunities here for a university to show really sizable leadership and have a public presence um, and show that, in fact, this can be done. And actually, athletics kind of did the same thing. And I think it was a good demonstrative... Um, case to say, look, if, if groups mitigate really carefully, you can, you can go about your business. Um, and I hope some people learn from that in hindsight. I certainly did. I think, I think number one, um, we, I say we, individuals in the vaccine world really had good confidence that mRNA technology would work and here we have two great examples of yes that that's true so number one the technology works better than we could have expected to be honest and so I think that helps because I think as you then look forward to say not just other pandemics but what other conditions could then have vaccine development where mRNA technology actually makes a big difference and so that's that's huge number two I think you have 
good examples now of how vaccine development can be safely accelerated in ways that don't compromise patient safety but do think about the balance of urgency in a pandemic and yet trying to get um, sort of approvals in place and pre-investments in place and, and, and support structures in place to allow vaccines to come through or not pass throughs. We know more now about how to sort of move that fast track along and how to balance that against the urgency of a pandemic. I would not expect every virus to rush through in the way that it did here because the urgency may not be there. But we get another, heaven forbid, SARS-3, then, then that sort of landscape is now better understood and I think the sort of the mechanisms are well lubricated to make that happen. So the, probably the first important thing to think about is this is what viruses do. The more virus we have transmitting between different people and, and busy in communities, the more variants will naturally evolve to try and evade us and to try and evade our vaccine defence. And so it's not surprising to me at all that as cases really ramped up and continue to ramp up in Brazil, that variants emerge that have a selective advantage. That's evolution at play in real time. But I would see the whole issue of variants, be it South African, Brazilian, UK, you name it, as a call for vaccine. Because in fact, if I can better approach us towards herd immunity, we drive down the number of cases. The likelihood of variants becoming prevalent drops and the likelihood of something that is more significant falls away. And the vaccines are still highly effective at preventing severe illness. So it's a call to vaccination. The long-term question is a little different, which is, you know, does this fall back into the realm of being a seasonal flu or a seasonal respiratory illness? I think it does, because I think you can now say, unlike SARS-1, where we had global control of this and eliminated it, there is no real, I think, path here of complete elimination given the transmissions that are occurring in multiple countries. So I think when you look forward and say, is this going to, you know, is, is, is COVID going to be with us? I think it will in some form, but you can, you can address that in a couple of ways. Number one, we now have great evidence that the vaccines work. I anticipate that we'll need to have modifications to the vaccines as we learn more about variants and frankly, how long the vaccine remains durable in us. But then the other thing is we have learned a wealth of stuff in the last year about how to actually keep ourselves safe. Like the fact that we are distanced here, the fact that we're outside, the fact that we all know our, you know, our, our masking and our family engagements and certainly act, certain activities that don't make sense anymore. And like we're going to have adjustments in the future where we look back to 2019 and go, yeah, you know, we're not going to do it that way anymore. And that that's going to keep this contained at a level which is not as impactful for all of us in the way that it has been in the last 12 months.